Hello, hello, and welcome to the Mobile UX Marathon, a series of weekly webinars by Google on how to improve user experience and conversion rates on the mobile web. Hi, my name is Anna, you know me, um, I'm your host today, and uh, we are very, very sad because this is our last live stream session of the Mobile UX Marathon, but today we have an incredible topic to discuss with you and also amazing speakers joining us today from London and Dublin. The first one is I'm going to introduce to you Dennis. He's just sitting next to me here in Dublin. Hi, Dennis. Hello, hello everyone. Uh, pleasure to be on the live stream. Uh, my name is Dennis, as you just said. Um, I'm on the same team as Anna, and I'm a mobile user experience specialist based here in uh, Google's uh, European headquarter, uh, helping our customers to improve their mobile user experience um, for the most part. And I'm going to talk a little bit about PWAs um, and give you some good examples of companies who have great uh, PWAs already. Um, and we're also delighted to have Victor on stream today. He's sitting in London. Hi, Victor. Hi. Uh, thanks for having me, and nice to meet you all. Um, like Dennis said, I'm Victor. I am part of the Google Pay team that sits in London, and my focus is on merchant partnerships, mainly in Germany, but uh, Europe in general as well. Um, in the second half of the presentation, I'm going to talk to you about Google Pay, obviously, and how that in uh, can increase your UX or improve your UX, especially in the checkout. Awesome. Thank you so much, Victor. Thank you, Danny. So hello, everyone from sunny Dublin and sunny London, hopefully. Um, so today at the last marathon session, we are going to do a quick recap of the entire Mobile UX marathon. Also remind you what was the pre-work video about in case you didn't have a chance to watch that. Today's content will be mostly devoted to case studies. We will have a look into case studies of Google Pay, uh, progressive web app technology, and uh, discuss different um, implementation scenarios, and then do Q&A. And we are very, very sad to say that we are going to wrap the marathon today. So up to the first part of that. This is a really cool animation. We've been working really, really hard yesterday. <laughs> wait for it, wait for uh. <laughs> Today is the very last session of the first ever Google's Mobile UX Marathon. We are very sad. And uh, we wanted to present you really cool, um, another really cool slide. Uh, so you may guess now in the chat what is this. And I'm Probably going to hold for a few seconds just to see what you're all saying. So this is obviously like just a, a bunch of different locations across the globe, and we, we what we basically have done for this live stream we went through all our past live streams that we had and we mapped where all our speakers were based. So basically, this is all the locations from where we had our incredible speakers during six live stream sessions just in EMEA. May I remind you, we also had similar live stream sessions in LATAM, North America, uh, and APAC. And also, so if I'm going to take all of these locations, these are all locations where our audience have been joining from. So very, very welcome. It's pretty, it's very international, pretty much all over the world. People have been listening to us and we've been really, really happy to get challenging questions from you. So thank you so much for your input and thanks so much for your feedback. So moving on to the next one, this is, these are all our amazing speakers. <laughs> Um, yeah, you can write now in the chat which live stream session was your favorite one. We had lots of people, lots of experts in different areas. And you may also notice that we have two screenshots from the future, <laughs> screenshots of Dennis and Victor. Yeah, so this is an option as well. You can vote for this session, basically, although you don't know what's going to come. But maybe if you, if you trust us, <laughs> give us your vote. Yeah. So the live stream section number session number six was the best one, obviously. <laughs> um, yeah, so we're again very, very sad. But thanks, everyone, all our amazing speakers, content creators, uh, content leads, everyone who was working on this really, really hard. And thanks to our audience, again, for participation, for joining in. 
And yeah, this is our last se uh, session of the Mobile UX Marathon. We've been very um, interested to see what kind of feedback you are going to provide us on every of the topics. So the topic on the Mobile UX best practices probably was, was like where you had the majority of questions submitted, but also all the rest of the uh, topics. Like, thanks, thanks for your amazing questions. We are taking this feedback and we're now planning on how we want to action on this and what kind of webinars we're planning to run in the future. Uh, a quick ask uh, before again we jump to the content, please. You now can go back and watch all of our previous live streams and fill out the feedback forms. After this live stream, you will receive a feedback form for just this last live stream number six. But also, it's gonna have it, it's it's going to have the links for all other feedback forms. So you still have time to submit feedback to us, and this is. It's, it's very important for us because that's how we will basically identify the most active participants uh, and reward them. Yeah. So please go back uh, to the Mobile UX Marathon website or to the Conversions Google channel. There is a playlist with all the live stream videos. You can watch them now and provide feedback. And the feedback on the last session was pretty good. So basically, um, it was a good idea to do a live UX audit. Maybe, again, for future initiatives like that, we should consider doing this more. Uh, again, great feedback on the Q&A se session. And the live demo was great. So thanks a lot, Maya, who did that uh, demo. Um, I, <laughs> I promised you to answer one question that we kept receiving all over through the marathon. We actually had a lot of students watching us, and you know, uh, we're delighted to have the, the student audience uh, listening to Google. And a lot of questions were about, like, I'm just starting as a UX designer or UX researcher. So basically, how can I develop my UX skills? And I promised you that today I'm going to uh, maybe not give you a precise answer, but maybe just to give you a bit of a guidance. So first of all, um, you need to understand where you start, right? There are lots of things that you can do in the UX world, and uh, there are a lot of professions in UX. And moreover, so this is where I just, uh, on this slide, I listed all the UX professions I could find. We few of them we have at Google, but more of them we uh also just i found online uh you need to understand what is what out of this is, is what you're interested in where your skill set lies what type of work you will be enjoying on the day-to-day -day basis and you obviously need to try you need to start small you need to start from different projects maybe uh some i don't know different joining different initiatives and that's how you will understand what area you basically you want to do you want to work with the ui do you want to work as a researcher with understanding people do you want to work with data and the strategy on the language so different different things and also there is like on the left those are um, professions of ux practitioners on the right those are mostly like so you can also be um UX consultant, as for example, we are here at Google, so you can work with different companies. You can be part of the agency that is doing UX audits. So it's really exciting uh, work as well. So you need to understand where your strengths are. And after that, like we can uh, maybe suggest you a um, few resources to read. So obviously, Mobile UX Marathon and all uh, Google websites that we have suggested to you during the MobileX Marathon. So Win and Mobile course by Lena, Masterful Mobile, which we plan to update regularly. Uh, there are lots of resources on the MobileX Marathon websites and Conversions Google channel is a really great resource, the one that you're watching now. Um, and also, uh, yeah, there is a Google a link to Google design uh, Podcasts. It's called Method Podcast. Uh, so what I'm going to do now, I'm just going to ping all these links into the chat because on the next slide I have even more links. This is our different uh, people we're following, uh, different um, uh, sources of 
our daily UX inspiration. And uh, these are different blogs that we are reading on a daily basis, different books that you can also look up online if you want to, if you're starting in the UX design world or if, you, if you're a professional there. Yeah, so these are really, really great resources and we are all following them. Um, yeah, on this note, I'm going to have this up. Oh, yeah, that this is also something that I'm doing, and then I'm going to go into ping all these resources into the chat. So, uh, hopefully, you had a chance to watch a video by Ryan Warner uh, where he explains uh, really well what are different uh, technologies uh, of progressive web um, and what are different technologies that you can leverage to achieve a an app-like uh, experience on the web. So first of all, you can use AMP in order to make your pages fast, and you can use AMP technology on just your landing pages, or you can use it for your entire website. At the moment, the functionality of AMP allows you to do a lot of things. Uh, he also talks about like an umbrella of technologies called PWA, Progressive Web Apps, and uh, this is where, again, you, you can achieve this app-like native um, experience on the mobile web. Uh, you can um, do uh, push notifications, you can um, implement add to home screen, you can um also do the offline mode so many different things and we're going to uh, cover this in today's case studies and also you can simplify the checkout uh, with google pay and today victor is going to deep dive into this a bit more and you can simplify the login and notification process with google sign in and credential manager api um, on this note uh, we are jumping into the content, and I am handing this over to Janice to present the case studies on progressive web apps. Perfect. Thank you so much. Maybe just a quick thing, because I read the chat a little bit while you were presenting. Um, first question we had was there, um, if a business analyst can fit into one of these roles, um, if you don't mind, I'm just going to answer this. I would say yes. Um, I myself um, started my career in game analytics and then web analytics. so. I guess yes. Um, again, as Anna said, I think it's important to find out where your strengths lie. So naturally, if you're an analyst, it's probably be more in the research area. And this might be something you hopefully enjoy. So this could be one of the, well, points where you can start. But I wouldn't limit myself to this. Um, I think it basically comes really down to what you enjoy doing and um, what not so much, I guess. Yeah, and uh, around the analytics, I think we have lots of different uh, departments at Google devoted just to doing product analytics, right? You can be business analyst or you can be product analyst. So it's kind of to leveraging the same knowledge and applying it to different areas. Um, yeah, with that, there is a lot of people doing that. Absolutely. So uh, thanks for the question. Anyway, um, please keep them coming. Uh, we're going to ping you some of the links now. And I think then we're going to switch back to our slides. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to present, hopefully, some interesting case studies for you. Um, so first of all, a quick reminder about um, what um, a progressive web app or what this whole methodology of software development framework stands for. Um, we usually ex like to explain this with acronyms, um, mainly because this acronym is great. It's FIRE. Um, so what we mean by that is um, you want to be fast, first of all. And I think this is a really nice example from Twitter Light here. Um, which I believe is a TWA as well, a trusted web um, application. Um, so as you can see here, if you tap the Twitter light um, icon here from your home screen, it basically instantly pops up on your phone. So this is one of the well things we mean by fast, obviously. Um, then you also want to be integrated, meaning that you want to engage your users or give them at least a chance to um, be engaged to engage with you. Um, and this is an example by the Washington Post here, um, where they prompt the add to home screen, um, basically making sure it's easier for you to use their PWA whenever you want um, without typing in a URL or whatever. You just go to your home screen um, and tap the, the app logo there or the PWA logo there. Um, you want to be reliable. 
And what we mean by that is basically you want to create also this app-like experience of even being um, available when offline, obviously maybe not with all the features, um, but you want to think about what you can provide your users even if they don't have an internet connection. Um, and I think Trivago is doing a nice job here. So first of all, what you always want to do is you want to tell people that they're offline. So this is the main reason why some of the functionalities are not working at the moment. Um, you want to ideally show them um, that you're going to reconnect or try to reconnect them um, in a certain time interval, um, but also give them the chance to reconnect or try to reconnect themselves. Um, and then they also have a nice little game here. They have this maze um, that uh, basically um, keeps people engaged while waiting. I think that's a quite nice, playful idea they, um, they had here with the PWA. Um, and last but not least, you want to be engaging. And this is, um, I think, one of the main well-known features of a PWA, meaning that you want to have the uh, chance to actually use push notifications to engage or even re-engage with your users um, and inform them about hopefully interesting content for them. So that was just a quick reminder of how uh, we think about PWAs. And now um, just two quick examples of um, two case studies where we think those PWA ideas um, uh, integrated really well. So apologies if we have French viewers or French speaking viewers, if I butcher the name here a little bit, my, my French is a bit rusty. Um, but this is a, a French um, large inventory um, retailer called Rue du Commerce. I hope I pronounced it correctly. Um, and what they did they had two of the main um, PWA features we just talked about implemented on their site. Uh, one of them is the Add to Home screen to basically engage or re-engage with their um, customers and users. And the other one is caching for offline browsing. Um, and as you can see here on the left side, um, the, and this is probably the easiest way into getting into um, a PWA, um, is creating um, a branded experience as an offline um, or get creating a branded offline experience. So instead of just showing a browser 404 site here, um, you can basically have a branded site that shows, sorry, you're offline. Um, and well, ideally, you even want to offer more there if you can. And the other thing they did here was add to home screen, um, which for, I guess, retailers is always a great way to, well, work and re-engage with their users. Um, so some of the results they've seen, um, this is comparing um, users that came from the Add to Home screen, so open it from there, versus um, their traditional um, web or mWeb users. Um, and for those users who came through that Add to Home screen, they half basically cut the bounce rate in half. Um, they also saw a 1.8 factor increase in their conversion rate. Um, the average order basket increased by 30%. Um, and the page views per session also more than doubled. Um, so these are great numbers. Um, I think it's um, important to keep in mind that we're probably talking about their um, most, most loyal users there. Um, but then again, it's great that those very loyal um, core users, if you want so, um, get this chance to engage more with their brand. So um, I think that's actually a really nice example of um, to, uh, how to create an extra experience or a more of an experience um, for your users. And the other one is Etam, um, uh, also a retailer um, for women's lingerie. I think they themselves call themselves a corset maker. Um, and they are around for a while now. I think they just checked it on their site, started in 1916 in Paris, if I'm not um, if I'm correct here, uh, meaning this is a very well-established brand. Um, which I think makes it even more interesting if you consider that oftentimes those very traditional and well-established brands sometimes don't really get their digital experience right. Um, at least, well, you all probably know some of those um, brands that kind of like not yet there when it comes to digital. Um, Itam here, I think, is the polar opposite. Like they're around for a while, but they have a great experience here. Um, and we posted some of the uh, screenshots here. They basically they did they went all in for a PWA, so they have all the features um, and they have implemented them. I think very very nice. So not just for the sake of implementing them, but really implemented them in a very um, nice way. Um, 
But before we jump into those single features, maybe let's have a quick look on why they did this um, in terms of what was the business reasoning behind it. Um, so basically, Tom was seeing a lot of the well things that we see with most or a lot of our customers are seeing. So basically, for them, 70% of the sessions were coming from mobile devices. Um, but what they were also seeing, and um, let us know in the chat if this is uh, similar for you, maybe. Um, unfortunately, the conversions there weren't on par. Um, so it was roughly around 36% of conversions um, that were coming from mobile. Um, so what we sometimes hear now um, is that people say, well, or our customers say, we don't really see the business um, reasoning to invest more in our mobile site because the conversions are not really there. They turned this basically around. Tom was saying, well, we see this big opportunity here in this gap, and this is our reasoning why we think um, we should invest more in this mobile site. Um, what they also decided there is that they want to rather focus on doing uh, creating a PWA instead of redoing their app. Um, so what they basically did, they started um, building a single page application, which is usually one of the first steps um, you want to do um, if you're thinking about um, getting into the PWA space. And they focused on server-side rendering um, and JavaScript splitting. Both of those measures are mainly to increase speed and to get ready, um, basically, as in to have a solid base for a PWA. Um, you need to be fast. Um, what they also did, um, they tried to mimic those app experience that the that most users would know from using apps in their PWA as well. So what they did basically is whenever someone came from the app to home screen, um, for those users, they put the navigation bar at the bottom. I'm um, going to see a screenshot on this later or in a bit. Um, basically letting you use um, well this mobile site easier, telling people this is a mobile first um, uh, website experience. Um, then again, as I said, they went all in. They also had an offline mode for their account pages. Um, and they also um, started using push notifications to engage with the customers more. Um, so basically, the whole package. Um, the results they were seeing um, were great. Um, so first of all, their first paint, um, you probably have heard this um, from us before. First paint is uh, one of the main metrics you probably want to look at if you want to invest more in your site's performance. Um, so the first paint shows within two seconds, which is blazingly fast. Um, they had an 18% 18 uplift in average order value. Um, they had an increase in desktop CVR as well. We see that quite often if people invest in their mobile experience, that this can also have some cross-device effect. Um, because people start researching at mobile sites, um, and if they have a better experience here, it's also more likely that if they not convert, that they then will later on convert on your um, desktop page. Um, the conversion rates were very, very close to the app. And in the end, they actually decided to deprecate their app um, to save, I guess, some um, implement, like, um, extra implementation uh, efforts there. Um, and what they also have shared with us is that the put push notification of opening rates sorry, are very similar to their email marketing campaigns. So for those of you out there who are working a lot with email campaigns, you know that this can mean a lot if you have a solid opening rate there. Um, and this is also a great way to reach your users. Yeah. So let's look a little bit more into the um, single features they did, um, or give you a bit more of a visual context here. So first of all, they have now um, a prompt to ask, hey, dear user, can we send you a push notification? And they for now, do this on the first screen and on the order confirmation. Um, and this is something we would always um, urge you to consider if you're thinking of um, creating those push notifications. Think when to ask your users for that. Um, because, well, worst case, you don't want to spam your users. You want to, your users to give a little bit of time to engage with your brand. And if you think, well, now is the time, it's uh, ideal to ask them. And as we just said, that basically was uh, very similar to the email marketing opening rates. Um, second feature they had, they had added an add to home screen banner on their home page. Um, you can see this on the left hand side on the screenshot um, at the bottom there. Um, this is basically the, uh, well, they're asking there, can we add you to home screen? Um, and 
on the right side, what you see as well is when or if someone was coming from that Add to Home Screen button, they were also using this um, bottom navigation, uh, which is always a nice thing to have on mobile because it's just easier to use. Um, you all know it. You Most of us probably use their mobile phone with one or two hands, but it's always easier to reach stuff that's in the lower half um, of the screen, um, mainly because our mobile devices are quite big. Um, they also had an uh, offline page implemented. Um, and they are not just showing um, the fact that they are offline. And so they also worked on the ability to navigate on pages that were previously browsed, which is great, because this um, gives you something to do, even if you're online as a user. Um, and they also focus on some features that could be useful in that specific case. So they focus on the My Account part. And they have a loyalty card there and points, um, which basically enhances the in-store experience, even if you're online. So I think there's a really good use case of how to use those offline pages. Um, because there's a couple of things you want to consider when having an offline page. Obviously, it's I think it's safe to say that it's always better to have a branded offline experience than just your 404 site um, in your browser. Um, but ideally, you want to have something more, a little bit more that you can do when you're offline um, for your users and keep them engaged. Um, and now, last but not least, um, they also implemented Google Pay, um, which Basically, I think the main thing why it is important, I hope Victor will agree with me in this in a, with this in a second, he's the expert here. But from my personal point of view, I think it's important if you have um, a lot of like single item checkouts um, to make it as easy as possible for users um, to just basically click um, and then pay. Um, so this is very, very relevant for single product purchases, as stated here. Um, and on the screenshot, you can also say there, uh, see there's our um, branded Google Pay button. Branded Google Pay button, that's a tricky one. Um, but enough um, from me here. I think this is a perfect segue to hand it over to Victor um, and let him tell us a little bit more about uh, Google Pay in general. So over to you, Victor. Yeah, thanks. Excellent segue. If we go to the next slide. Um, yeah, I'll take a step back and explain again what we're trying to achieve and how, how we're going to achieve this. And I'm going to talk you uh, through nine best practices afterwards and a few case studies. So uh, what's Google Pay in general? So it's a, what we're trying to do is um, provide a universal payment method that works anywhere. So that's online, that works in-store, uh, that works uh, on any device, on any surface, on any browser. And um, why is Google in a good position to do this? As you can see on the left side, um, these are all our, our uh, products um, that have at least a billion users, except I think the assistant is the only one that doesn't have a billion users. And that's a massive number um, if, you, <laughs> if you think about that. Um, and all of those, a lot, not, not all of those, but a lot of those uh, services, um, you can actually transact something. Um, yeah, on, on them, you can transact on something as a user. So we, as Google, are a merchant itself. Um, take the example of the Play Store. If you download an app um, that you have to pay for, um, we have a, a credit card information or, or, or PayPal um, um, information saved to your Google account. Another, another example is the YouTube um, uh, channel or YouTube platform. If you rent a movie on YouTube or buy a movie, Again, you have to pay for that, and that's the credit card information or payment information that we have saved on file. Another example is uh, Google Chrome. You might have seen those um, little uh, pop-up windows that say you want to save your card to Google Chrome after you saved some uh, after you typed the card information in in another checkout form. Um, that again is a is a payment information that it's saved um, and linked to your Google profile. So what we can do with this payment information, we um, the, like the result of that is that we have hundreds of millions of, of those payment credentials saved on Google profiles, and we can now offer them to the user to pay anywhere. So that obviously includes um, uh, in-store payments um, in, in some countries. Um, so that requires the app to, to tokenize it, um, but it also to tokenize the payment credentials. I mean, um, that uh, also offers us the opportunity to um, do voice commerce with, with Google Pay in the backend. And then also, most importantly, for this workshop now, 
Um, it enables um, merchants that implement Google Pay API on their website um, for, for, uh, to access those, those users' payment credentials that we have um, saved on Google Profiles. So the uh, key benefit here, uh, focusing on the, on the online API, uh, it's that it works on all browsers. So um, obviously, it works on Chrome. But it also works on Safari. It works on Firefox, so you also reach all devices. Um, it obviously works on Android apps. It does not work on iOS apps. But again, uh, since it works with, with Safari, our reach also goes into, into, um, into iOS. Um, it works, um, again, the online API works with across all countries and with all banks. So we don't, when you hear we launch a Google Pay in a certain market or in a certain country, that's only for the install functionality. The online API works across all countries where the Play Store uh, is active. So um, that's um, in, in the majority of countries that you would be active in as well. And um, it again it also works with all all cards that you can pay online with um so that's credit card debit cards and uh, also paypal um but paypal is limited at the moment to the us and germany um key benefit of this um online api it's uh, it's free so whatever processing fees that you currently have with your payment service provider um remain the same we don't charge anything on top of that so uh, integrating the Google Pay API is completely, um, completely free of charge from a Google perspective. Um, so basically, only um, uh, yeah, improve the UX, but we don't change anything from uh, the um, existing infrastructure that you have with your payment processor in the back end. Um, it's also uh, an open API. So um, the link is on the website uh, where you can see the technical um, information. So everybody can implement it. It only goes at the end uh, before you go into production access. It goes through a review from our team. But in principle, if you're not uh, a shady a shady merchant and you don't um, uh, go against our brand guidelines, uh, everybody can implement this. And also an important factor for the European uh, merchants um, on the 14th of September, every e-commerce site needs to be SEA compliant. So it's, that's the two-factor authentication that you have to do for card payments online, um, which Google supports as well. Uh, Google Pay uh, supports as well and is fully SEA compliant. Um, cool. So that's on the product. Um, now we can go into the best practices, um, number one. So here you can clearly see where we're trying to to solve for um, or the main problem that we're trying to solve for. So we see that around 30% of uh, the card abandoners are due to um, uh, too many steps to purchase. So we, with Google Pay, we reduce those steps to purchase. As you can see here on the right uh, at an, uh, from an Airbnb example. So um, once you have Google Pay implemented, um, the user can use all the payment methods that he has saved to the Google profile and also the shipping and billing information. So there's no need uh, to type all of that in, um, which is especially cumbersome on a mobile device. But you truly have a two-click checkout. So if you can see on the right now, if you go and confirm booking, and then the payment sheet from Google Pay comes up, and then you confirm in a second time, and that's it. Um, so that drastically reduces your, your time to checkout and hence increases your conversion rates drastically. Uh, the second best practice, if we go to the next slide, um, so Google Pay can obviously also uh, help to onboard your new users quickly. So, um, like I said, even if you, if you, if you, especially if you have a new user, um, you don't need to type all of this stuff in again. Um, wherever you onboard, uh, if it's a new app, if it's a new website um, that has Google Pay supported. Um, all your shipping information, payment information, all that is already saved, and you don't need to type that in again. Uh, a right example is uh, a DoorDash app where you can see that Google Pay is, is uh, a default payment method. Um, also important to know, um, we only there's the option that you only show the Google Pay button or Google Pay as a payment credential um, if we have uh, uh, a payment method on file. So if the user uh, doesn't have a payment method uh, saved to their Google Pay account or the, to their Google account in general, um, you can choose to not display the button at all, which um, obviously would increase friction otherwise if 
we don't have a payment method on file, and then you cl click on Google Pay, and then you have to edit within Google Pay. Um, that um, would exactly increase the friction that we don't um, that we're trying to solve here. Um, but as a good uh, thing, if you if you input it once into Google, it works uh, across across all the other Google Pay applications as well. Uh, the third best practice on the next slide, um, as you can see here from from the Starbucks uh, app. Similar to what I said before, but the key message that we can point out here is that the user doesn't have to um, update their payment uh, credentials if they change. So for example, your card expires or you get a new card, um, or again, you want to add PayPal. Um, you do that once in your Google profile, and everywhere where Google Pay works and Google Pay is enabled automatically um, updates to that. So if I have three different merchants accounts and four different apps and like five different food deliveries and transit and whatnot, um, I only need to and, and have a new card. I don't need to go into all of those properties. I update this once in the Google account and um, it automatically updates in, in all the other um, merchants websites where, where Google Pay is enabled. Next best practice, best practice um, enable guest checkout. So what we've seen is um, that there's a significant number uh, of, of card abandoners that come from um, you forcing your, your users to um, create, a, create an account uh, before they check out. So um, what we can do with Google Pay is um, that you enable guest checkout with Google Pay. So um, as soon as the, as the user pays, obviously, you as a merchant get all the um, relevant information to, to process the payment and ship. So that's uh, email address, that's the card information, um, so what type of card it is in the last four digits. That includes the shipping address um, and the billing address, which is usually the same. Well, not all, usually, but sometimes. Um, and um, after the user has completed the purchase, uh, you can then prompt them to um, to create an account with those with these information. So um, as you can see here on the on the right, uh, Macy's example. Um, again, the left the left screen is um, is showing the Google Pay integration with the with the guest checkout, and uh, on the right screen you can see after the purchase has been completed. Um, they prompt the user to create an account, um, give them a little incentive even, uh, and ask if they want a 20% uh, of the next purchase if they create that account. Next slide. Um, yeah, another best practice is uh, to be transparent. Um, this is uh, especially um, uh, useful now with Google Pay because we recently launched this new feature. Um, we saw again another reason for for high card abandonment is that the uh, total cost wasn't clear up front. So um, what I mean by that, uh, here's the example of of varying shipping costs, um, which you can implement into Google Pay directly. So um, again, you have this very seamless uh, two-click checkout, um, which we can see when the gift runs through. So here, you buy with Google Pay, you click on it. Uh, and then you can scroll to the to the shipping information, and um, if you change the standard shipping, fast shipping, or express shipping, the price changes instantly, and the user knows exactly upfront um, what they need to pay, and they're not um, annoyed afterwards that they that they have to pay more or even abandon the card. Worst case scenario for you, because they weren't informed um, about all the extra costs that come to that. Next slide. Yes. Um, so be consistent. Um, what he what causes friction or what causes dissatisfaction for the users if they don't uh, see the payment method that has been used throughout. So in this example, um, you can see that Google Pay, for example, um, has has been stated, and then also what card uh, has been used, um, which in this case is a MasterCard. So if you, for example, if you um, implement Google Pay and then the user pays with Google Pay, and then on your confirmation or on, on your bill, uh, you only display that it's paid with MasterCard, and and um, the user doesn't know if it comes from Google Pay or, or where you got that information from, that causes dissatisfaction and uh, decreases user trust. Next slide. Um, and here, like I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, we can now also um, use uh, PayPal in the US and Germany. Um, as you can see here, the right example with Flixbus, um, allowed choice. Um, so 
once you can see here on the right side um, within this payment sheet that you that you see um, from Google Pay, you can choose your the payment method that you that you prefer. So that's one. Obviously, if you have several cards on file, if you want to have uh, if you want to pay with your Amex because that gets you more points, or like uh, you want to pay with your with your loyalty card for for flights um, when you when you purchase a, an airline ticket. Um, all of that can be can be um, switched within Google Pay within that within that user interface, and also, um, like I mentioned, you can do that with with PayPal in the US and Germany without having to log into uh, into the PayPal account. So um, you you still have this very seamless and very uh, simple. Um, uh, UX, which is embedded into your site, which comes from the Google Pay payment sheet, as we say, um, where you can switch easily between the uh, payment methods without having to um, switch accounts, relog in, or change any um, any information that you already have saved to the Google uh, account. Next slide. Um, and that's what we saw. Here's Etam again. Um, that's what uh, Dennis also mentioned earlier. Um, Enable direct purchases. So you can see here that Google Pay. You don't have to. Uh, you can. You can. It's basically up to you where you implement it. Um, best practice in this case is the product page. Um, so you don't even have to go go to the cart. Um, you can directly purchase from the product page. And obviously, the the, the shorter the the path to purchase, the higher your conversion rates. Um, so this is the best practice that we saw from Etam. Um, you can also implement Google Pay uh, at any at any stage of the purchase, really. So the, the shortest would be uh, product page. Uh, you can also have it in the shopping cart uh, checkout page, or uh, even after somebody signed into your account. But then obviously that uh, decreases the uh, the usability because that's exactly what we're trying to solve for. That you don't have to log in yet. You don't have to uh, type in any information additional to to what we already have on file. And last but not least, on the next slide, Google Pay, um, although it's called Google Pay, uh, it does not just offer payments. We are also a wallet solution, like you might know from, from, the, uh, from the Apple wallet. Um, so you can also save valuables. Um, so at once, here's an example from, from Ryanair. First of all, you can purchase your ticket with Google Pay that you can see on the left screen with the, with the Buy with Google Pay uh, API. But then you can also save your ticket to um, to the Google Pay app, um, so uh, it's not limited. So you can with that you can increase the the seamless experience basically that you that you can offer your your users and very fast you can uh, trigger them to purchase and also to convey the tickets later on. So we also have uh, transit tickets for that. You, we have uh, event tickets for that. We have loyalty cards. We have uh, gift cards. Uh, offers all of these can be saved to to Google Pay basically through the Google Pay app, and uh, you can then uh, the user can then either go to the go to the store or to the uh, to the train station or to the to the airport, and um, do these tickets with a normal QR code, and it also works with. With a solution that we call Smart Tap. So, um, if you are familiar with the mobile payment solution for in-store with Google Pay, um, where you just tap on the NFC uh, terminal, that also works with valuables. So, you, um, for example, you go into a football stadium and you just have to tap in with that ticket that you have saved to Google Pay, um, and you tap in and 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 enter the enter the stadium. Perfect. Next slide. Um, now we go into the case studies, um, and actually, what's the impact of impl implementing Google Pay, and what's the uplift? On the left side, again, my French is equally bad as Dennis's. So, <laughs> Rue Gilt, I guess, is the pronunciation, but I'm probably wrong. Um, they implemented uh, that exactly that the product to um, purchase uh, implementation is on 10% uplift in in conversions from Google Pay users over non Google Pay users. Um, so that's a retail example. On the right side, uh, we have a travel example from Welling, uh, which is the largest Spanish airline. Um, they saw a 17% increase in conversions uh, after they implemented Google Pay on their on their mobile web page. Next slide. Um, Thrive Market is a, a member-based um, grocery shop in 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 the US. Uh, they offer healthy um, yeah healthy healthy groceries. Um, they implemented Google Pay. And they saw um, 
get 27% um, basically so a 27% increase in monthly orders uh, order frequency from existing customers so because they offered such a seamless experience and such an easy checkout um, the existing customers that you already had ordered 27% more which is a huge increase and not just did they order more um, because you could say um, they just ordered the same stuff just uh, over over um, more orders uh, which would obviously increase the shipping cost but they also increased the shopping carts um, or the monthly spend if you will uh, by 17% so um, those users also become more valuable to or became more more valuable through um, Google Pay for Thrive. Next slide. Um, and here's Multikino, a Polish uh, cinema chain um, that implemented Google Pay, both the online API and also the Save to Google Pay uh, API um, that allows them to to save the digital uh, tickets for for the cinemas or for the movies. Um, after they implemented the Google Pay API for the online checkout, they saw a 20% increase in uh, in new accounts. So that uh, underpins the point that Google Pay is a great tool, especially for for new customer acquisition, because you don't have to again, you don't have to um, uh, sign up, you don't have to like um, in implement all those uh, or uh, input all those uh, credit cards and and shipping information and all that. So it's a great um, tool to, to get new customers, which they saw an increase of 20%, like I said. And then also they saw a 35% increase in, in conversion uh, rates from Google Pay users versus non-Google Pay users. And also those users uh, that bought their tickets online, uh, a fifth of those, so um, uh, that's 20%. Um, saved it to Google Pay, so that that shows that the um, that people want those digital tickets or those digital valuables, as we call them, and uh, they make great use of it um, and enhances this seamless experience that we're trying to solve for here um, in a great deal. Excellent. I think that was all from my side, and now we jump to Q and A, and I give it back to Anna. Thank you so much, Victor. Uh, I think it was a really insightful presentation, and thanks so much for your case studies. They were from different industries, and I know that our audience have been complaining about that we only have retail case studies. Now, hopefully, you've got some inspiration from different industries. I know people have been asking also for airline case studies, so we've got like two of them, Ryanair and Vueling. So thank you so much, Victor. Uh, now, jumping on to the Q&A. And we do have a few questions that came from you through, throughout the forum. And we're going to just go to the first one. Um, so, hi, team. You've mentioned that both AMP, you, you mentioned both AMP and PWA. It seems that PWA would be a better approach to take for mobile pages since it's reliable, fast, and engagement in engaging. However, AMP seems to be a Google thing, and it's rather limiting the visual. So which would be a more beneficial approach to take for the long run? And again, we're just quoting the question as is. <laughs> uh, and yeah, I'm just give, going to give it over to Dennis to take that one. Yeah, so first of all, thank you for this very in-depth question. Um, let me answer this with a couple of points. Um, so, first of all, I think it's important to state that um, it's, it's a, not a real comparison because AMP is a web um, a component based framework, whereas PWA is um, a software development methodology. So, you, it's more compa um, comparing a technology to, well, a software development methodology. Um, having that said, it basically means they both work together because PWA is not an exclusive technology that contradicts AMP. Um, for example, um, there is a nice case on BMW.com. Um, they work together um, with a German agency, and they built an AMP that then leads into a PWA. Um, WeGo did the same. Um, they're a, a, a travel, uh, well, travel uh, company based in Southeast Asia, uh, mainly based in Southeast Asia, so they also have a great um, Concept on that. Um, I think um, so. Basically, what I want to say is you can have both working together quite seamlessly. Or seamlessly. Um, I think it's also worth pointing out that 
AMP or AMP is not a Google technology. Um, it is an open source framework. Um, they now oh, they, they now just established um, a new technical steering committee that was um, announced at the M conference in Tokyo, um, basically meaning that there's a committee now that decides on what to do with AMP and where it, where it will be headed um, from different companies. Um, I think there's someone from Microsoft on there. There's obviously someone from Google because we're also developing for that. Um, there's also open web ambassadors on that. So it is not a Google technology. Um, and hopefully to get to the core of your question of answering what do you want to do um, depends a lot on what um, business case you have. Um, so it's really hard to answer. Um, if you are very landing page driven, if you have a lot of landing pages that you advertise and you have a lot of mobile traffic, AMP might be just the right thing for you to do to start off, um, especially if you think that uh, speed and performance might be one of your problems. Usually a good indicator would be a high bounce rate for mobile users. Um, then maybe speed performance is your issue and AMP can be a perfect solution for that. Um, if you want to tackle other issues like um, re-engaging users, um, et cetera, PWA could be the other direction or maybe both. Um, and now it's not like on point answer, but I hope it helps a little bit to uh, maybe think about how to approach those two things together. Um, great. Thank you, Dennis. And um, the next question also we'll take out of the pre-submitted ones. And it's actually about Google Pay. Uh, and Victor, <laughs> I'm going to address that one to you directly. So which countries does Google Pay support? Yeah, great question. Um, so um, I mentioned it briefly in the in the presentation. And there's two ways of, of looking at this. So um, most important for this audience, um, in the vast majority of countries where you will be active, the online API is available. So um, that's over 70 countries worldwide. Um, and you can you can implement it um, through through the online one because obviously um, like I, like I mentioned earlier we're not uh, for the online payments we're not dependent on the banks um, which is a difference to in store because for in store uh, we have this uh, extra safety feature uh, that is called tokenizations so uh, what Google Pay does basically if you want to use your 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 card um, in, in in store to buy groceries to buy uh, whatever you buy offline um, the uh, credit card information is never saved on your device um, we would in conjunction with the banks uh, produce a uh, token that is device specific so if somebody uh, comes and and hacks into your into your phone and steals this uh, token basically the credit card information um, they can't do anything with it because it's linked to uh, linked to the device um, so because of that uh, we need the partnerships with the banks and uh, because of that um, we need to launch countries um to um yeah to to guarantee the safety feature um and that's available in in 30 countries worldwide and you can find the list on our website but again that's only for the in-store uh, payment piece for online it works uh in in over 70 countries which will be the majority of the countries that uh, you operate in thank you victor um yeah, so now we're going to take a few questions from the live chat. And by the way, thank you for all your comments about the best live stream ever. We're still <laughs> accepting your responses. So Bar Best, uh, uh, who is our regular listener from Ukraine, says the live stream four was the best. Uh, uh, Kelsey from South Africa says session two and three were uh, really great. Uh, and I also like the comment that EMEA live streams were the best, just and, in uh, general. Don't forget about uh, section six here. <laughs> section six, yeah. <laughs> like, share, and repost. Uh, so Bar Best actually asks us now regarding the progressive web technologies, um, what is more powerful to use progressive web apps or AMP for e-commerce website if company doesn't have a great app on iOS or Android? Um, yeah, again, uh, it's uh, it's hard to um, just say it's, it's not a very is this or that question, um, but maybe to give you some direction, um, if you think you have a good use case um, that uh, supports um, 
would support somewhat of an app, maybe think PWA. I would say it also depends um, upon are you a large inventory retailer in terms of e-commerce, or do you have many brands, and would you expect your users to come back? Um, and I don't know, buy multiple stuff. Maybe you even have something like fast-moving consumer goods, and you would expect people to buy that more frequently. Um, I think it's a great PWA example. Um, or are you like a single brand um, that uh, gets a lot of like first um, customer purchases? Then you might maybe want to think more about AMP. Again, I would approach it like this: AMP, um, more of a landing page solution, um, mainly targeted towards great responsive design and speed. PWA more into um, Think about how you can use app-like experiences like push notifications um, and add-to-home screen to re mainly re-engage your users if you think um, they need to be re-engaged or they want to engage more with you. I hope that gives a general direction that helps a little bit. Um, so, Dennis, if I can ask you to elaborate maybe a little bit more if we look into the future of mobile design, you know, we just completed the Mobile UX Marathon, we talked about web design, and we are finishing this last session with saying take inspiration from the native apps. So, how does how do these technologies are going to change we, in general, design for mobile? This was actually one of the questions that people submitted to us at the first day, the first live stream, and we kept it up till the very last one to answer that. OK. Um, yeah, I would say, think um, device capabilities, using device cap capabilities of a mobile phone for your website. Um, I think this is the way it will change um, midterm. And then maybe even long term, think about stuff you might be able to do with all those new technologies. Um, I'm thinking about the system. So general new stuff that will come up is how do we need to design for different input methods? Because now we're designing everything around touch on mobile. Um, maybe in the well nearer future, hopefully, we have to reconsider how we design for voice input um, or other kind of of yeah, I read the article recently about like designing for gestures and uh, poses. So that the, the reason why we've been designing for a tap or for a click was basically because we um, it was the rule that there is an interface. But yeah. do we actually need an interface? So is that any other way we can interact yeah. with, with the system? Yeah. So I think this is the long, longer uh, look into the future, if you can say that. And then I think um, we still haven't had too many amazing examples in terms of what can you actually do with an offline page. I know we have discussed this. Um, obviously, it could be something just as a branded experience, but what else could you do? As we thought about if you have um, stores, like physical stores, um, and someone is on the go, is offline, ideally they want to see where are those stores maybe. Um, this could be a very good use case of uh, use of an offline page, I feel. Um, but there's probably more we haven't even thought about. So what can you do that is really useful in that specific moment, um, which, again, picks up the rather old idea now of designing for experiences that are very tailored to this specific moment. I guess, in general, PWA gives you more tools at hand to actually think about that. Yeah. And uh, if our audience remembers, in the live stream number three, we had a case study of Google um, of YouTube Go and the way they basically approach the offline functionality in the next for the next billion users, they realize that when their users are offline, they, it's it's the advantage. It's when they can introduce them a new feature, they want to share the videos with each other. And that this is exactly the approach that you can undertake now of when you're designing experiences uh, for the mobile web. Uh, for your audience and with the progressive web app technology, this is something that you can achieve. And yeah, as Dennis has said, this is we don't have that many. There are no, not that many case studies out there on the uh, on offline functionality on the web. So this is your moment now to go to design sprint on that, uh, brainstorm with your team and create any exciting functionality for your business. 
So next question also uh, out of the pre-submitted ones and it's on Google Pay. So what's the fee for Google Pay? Is there a fee for Google Pay and what's that? So Victor, where? Yep. So um, I can probably mix this also with the, with a question that came from the live chat, um, which asks how long does it take to uh, refund the product cost uh, when something was paid by Google Pay? Um, so in general, like we don't change anything in the current uh, uh, structure that you have with with your payment per, uh, payment service provider or processor. So um, we you can basically see Google Pay as a, a channel through which we um, obviously one uh, drastically increase the the user experience and and the checkout flow through this uh, two click two click checkout. Um, but we just channel the, the the payload, so all the payment information through to you um, and pass it on to you or your payment service provider. Um, and in the end, they deal with whatever um, happens after that. So that's um, that means for one, um, if uh, a product gets returned or if, if, a, if, a, if a shipment gets canceled or whatever, that goes through your regular structure that you currently have. So um, it takes exactly the same amount of time uh, to, to get refunded um, th for a purchase that was made through Google Pay um, as, you, as, as it currently takes. Um, that said, um, we also don't change or we don't charge anything additional for this um, for this service to basically pass the payload towards you um, with this increased uh, or improved user experience. So Google Pay is uh, completely completely free uh, from our side. We don't charge anything. We don't charge uh, we don't charge the merchants. We don't charge uh, the banks, uh, which other uh, solutions, for example, do. And we also don't charge the user, obviously. So um, the underlying processing fees, obviously, that they currently have, uh, they um, they still remain because we don't process anything per se. Um, but we don't charge anything on top of it, and we also again don't change anything in the current structure when it comes to uh, returns and 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 all that. Awesome. Um, thank you, Victor. Thanks for taking the two questions <laughs> at once. So maybe we'll take just one, uh, the last question pre-submitted through the form, uh, which sound, uh, which is with, with progressive web apps. How do you ensure the customers the the customers their data is safe as native apps store the data on the device and are available offline, while progressive web apps would require a connection? Yes. No. <laughs> Thank you. So I guess it's it's the question about the safety of the data for uh, users and how would you ensure that with the progressive web apps technology? Yeah. So um, maybe one point we didn't really touch upon. Um, so first of all, PWAs by design are very safe. So you need to be an HTTPS um, to have a PWA to to be recognized as a PWA, for example, by our Lighthouse tool. Um, and there is also this thing um, I just briefly mentioned um, called a trusted web activity, which now allows you to upload your PWA to the Google Play Store. So it's more treated, or um, a little bit treated like um, a native app. Um, but this also means, um, and it's in the word itself, trusted web activities, it comes with a lot of high, very high security standards. Um, and to touch upon the point of how apps store data, it's pretty much the same how PWAs do it. Um, you have a service worker, and that data is stored client-side. So if you have an offline page, um, those data is stored client-side. Um, you can think about it a little bit like cookies. Um, so in theory, although it's technically obviously a different concept, um, it works it's stored at the, on the same side. So there's not a big difference in that regard. Um, so, But to s sum it up, um, there is a lot of um, high security standards that you have to be aware of if you want to build a PWA. And even higher security standards you have to uh, comply with if you want to have a trusted web activity. On this very positive mm -hmm. note, <laughs> um, I would like to Say goodbye to our audience. Say goodbye to the first ever Mobile EX Marathon. Thank you so much. Thanks for your participation, for your questions and feedback, and dialing in on the weekly basis. Thanks to our speakers today. Thank you, Victor from London.
Thank you. Um, thanks so much, Dennis. Um, and yeah, I will see you. I don't know when. Hopefully soon. <laughs> Hopefully soon we will take this time to analyze the results of this initiative and how did you like the topic? How do you like this engagement format? We will be back with more webinars, maybe not the marathon style, maybe different ones. But yeah, please share what you think about us on the social media and use the MUX Marathon hashtag for that. Thank you so much. I will see you. Bye. Goodbye. Bye.